Hello, I'm Hannah. Welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Tracy Seward and Jonathan Price. I'm Ellie and we are the founders of Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective curating a series of talks, talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speakers, please type them out onto the Q&A function, which should just be at the bottom of the middle of your screen, um, and we will read them out for you. Do bear with us if there are any technical difficulties, and just let us know in the chat if there are any problems hearing or seeing us. Enjoy the Q&A. So our guests don't really need any introduction, but Jonathan and Tracy work together on the critically acclaimed film The Two Popes, with Jonathan being nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor for his work as Pope Francis. Jonathan is an acting giant, most known for his portrayal of Hamlet, High Sparrow in the Game of Thrones, and opposite Glenn Close in The Wife. Tracy is an Academy Award nominated producer, known for her work on Philomena, The Queen, and War Horse. We are incredibly honoured to have these creative greats speak. So our first two questions for you about are about how you entered the industry in your, your early career. So Tracy, how do you sort of define your role as producer and how did you sort of get into it to start with? Well, I mean, I think the role of producer today, I mean, is such a sort of, you know, particularly, particularly today, there are so many um, ways of defining what a producer does. But I think probably the, the way I could describe my role best is more like a mother hen or Mother Teresa, as our cinematographer on Two Popes calls me. Um, not bigging myself up as Mother Teresa, by the way. Um, so it's a sort of like, you know, you, what you try and do is protect. It's a sort of protection. It's a sort of development and protection of whatever the project is. So you try and place it in the best hands that you can, whether in terms of the whole creative team and the cast, and do your best to manage that and manage the um yeah the delivery of the product really you know so that um you know what you know in terms of what the script was meant to be that you're able to deliver that in the best way possible and ensure that everybody around that creative team and all the people involved in it you know also have i would call i would describe it as a sort of enjoyable and you know collaborative creative process and how did you know when you wanted to to be in film or production? Well, I mean, I, I, sleight of hand, really. Um, I've done, I did a few things before I became involved in production. But one of the jobs that I had was a job I left university. I was working at a theatrical agency. It was my first job. And one of the clients was an actor called Ray McAnally, who I you some of you you all may know a wonderful great giant of, of cinema and television theater and um ray said to me he'd just done a movie called the mission and he said oh you shouldn't be doing this job you should come you should be making a film like this and he took me to see the mission and i was like held his hand at the end wow. and i was like great that's what i'm going to do so i sort of forayed in through and to cut a very long story short that was my that was my inspiration for becoming involved in cinema from the start. Lovely. So, Jonathan, when did you know that you wanted to be an actor, and how did you decide between stage and screen? I thought I oh, stage and screen. Um, I had never really intended to be an actor when I uh, left. I left school at sixteen and went to art school for two years, and then trained to teach art and. Um, you had to do a subsidiary course, and I was told the easiest course to do that required the least amount of work was the drama course, and uh, that proved to be true. Um, but uh, the more I, I, I acted in college, and I had a wonderful uh, tutor, a man called Jerry Dawson. Um, this is in the uh, late 60s, mid to late 60s. Uh, Jerry Dawson, Jerry ran Unity Theatre in Liverpool. And they were an amateur company, but they were affiliated to Unity in London, which was a, a communist based theatre company. Um, and uh, I started working with them and doing uh, college productions. And I found that um, more people were saying they liked my acting than were saying they liked my painting. And uh, 
we're all a, you know, a bit of a praise whore. So I thought that was that was a good way to go. <laughs> but it was it was down to one uh, tutor at another college, the college down the road, the girls' college in Kirby, um, and a man called William Murray who saw me act and he asked me if I'd ever thought of being an actor and I said no and he said I think you should and I think she got a rada where he had been and he uh, got me the the papers and coached me through two audition speeches and uh, I got in got a scholarship and that um, that was 1969 and that was really the beginning of my education in uh, in theatre because as a young you know, growing up in North Wales, there wasn't any theatre. There was a pantomime uh, once a year at uh, London or Chester, and or we'd go to Liverpool for a big day out. Um, so I, I'd not been exposed to a lot of theatre until I was a student in Liverpool, and I began going to the Everyman Theatre, and uh, knew when I went to Rada that was the place I wanted to work, and uh, I, again was a socialist-based theatre. Um, and that was my first job and I stayed there for two years. But the transition from theatre to film, um, when I started in 1972 and I wanted to work in theatre, um, that's what I wanted to do. And you would do television in order, in order to pay for the theatre work. And then films were something that uh, other people did. I had no aspirations to be a film actor. Um, and uh, it, it, it did work out eventually, <laughs> the transition <laughs> to films. But um, it, and I, I still go between theatre and film uh, often. And I, uh, partly because uh, when I was younger, it, was, it would have been impossible to make a, a living or to be continuously employed in film if you didn't also do uh, theatre or television. It's, it's unlike America where it becomes it's very uh, divided, it's what it used to be, quite specialist. You either did television or you did theatre or you did film. Um, mm. But everything is kind of blended together now. Um, just to move on to some questions quickly. Thank you for that, it was really, really interesting. Um, really do we have some questions about... Oh, sorry, I just interrupted you. Um, but um, on the two popes, why did you both decide to take up this project? What drew you to it? Should I go off, start, kick off, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for the director, Fernando Morales, and I made a movie together before called The Constant Gardener. And, you know, we'd looked at trying to do another project together since then. And Fernando had been sent this script um, by a, an American producer called Dan Lin. And um, he was like, you know, this is really interesting. What do you think? Um, and I read the script and I was just like, yeah, this is the project that we should both do together. It would been like, you know, 12 years or 13, 12, 13 years since we've worked together. Um, so that was the sort of like introduction to the script. But I think also, I think, you know, so that we don't repeat it. Jonathan and I, I'm going to leave some of this for Jonathan. Um, but, you know, the, the, the script of the two popes, it felt like an incredibly relevant script for today. And it felt um, that it would appeal to an audience that was both Catholic and religious and also an agnostic or atheist audience as well because it touches on some really fundamental themes that are really like important to me in terms of storytelling. And those are, you know, to name but a few, um, but maybe the most important one from my point of view, which was um, in an incredibly divided community, an incredibly divided world. And, I, and you experienced it a lot. And I feel responsible for it too in my own behavior during, for example, the Brexit campaign, where you literally don't want to, you want to close your ears, you want to close your eyes, you don't want to listen to the other side. I didn't want to listen to people talking about Brexit. I'm a firm Remainer. I felt that I was like, and I just thought, this is actually a story that, that shows you the, how valuable it is to really pay attention and to really listen and to pay attention and to listen sometimes to the people that you really disagree with 
and whose opinions are really um, not going to be shared by you. So, and obviously the ability to not only listen, but the ability to forgive. And that's not the domain of faith. That's, that's the domain of human nature. Over to you, Jonathan. Okay. Um, well, I was uh, sent the. Well, at first, I was given the idea by my agent that I that they're interested in your playing uh, Pope Francis, and I, um, I was was my first thought was uh, that's something I quite uh, wouldn't want to do because I thought it'd be on hiding to nothing because a living Pope and. Uh, um, you know, I, and by then I hadn't read the script and I didn't know who was going to direct it. Um, it was odd um, because when I, I before uh, doing this, I played the High Sparrow and I, uh, when I'd been asked about High Sparrow during press conferences, uh, I was making references to Pope Francis that um, uh, High Sparrow was doing everything that the, the new Pope was doing. He was talking uh, for the poor and about the poor. He was feeding people, he was washing their feet and uh, everything High Sparrow was doing. Um, and also the, the day he'd become Pope, the internet was full of images of the two of us. Um, is John the Christ the Pope and vice versa? Um, and the, there seemed to be a kind of uh, inevitability about it all that I would uh, play him um, but I said yes fairly quickly when I knew that uh, that Fernando was going to be directing it because uh, City of God is one of my all-time favorite films and knowing that that man uh, uh, who has that kind of filmmaking ability and that kind of energy that he brings to a project was was going to make it just in itself a very interesting film, whether it was about two popes or not, it was just going to be um, an interesting film and an interesting project to be a part of. Um, and it turned out, to, well, thinking about uh, Pope Francis, and I, he was the first pope that I'd ever um, taken any notice of, uh, in, certainly in my adult life, but um, he was the first person who was saying things that I wanted and needed to be said by a, a world figure um, about the climate, about immigrants, um, about, uh, about absolutely everything. I mean, he's still, there are still vast areas that um, the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church I disagree with. Um, and they're the fairly common things that most people who aren't Catholic uh, disagree with. But um, I saw him eventually as an extraordinary uh, character, and this was telling a great story. And uh, and I'd also I'd said yes before knowing who was going to be uh, playing um, Pope Benedict. So um, and we're, I, I'm Dr. Tracy. There were some very, you know, there, there's there are tiers of casting, and you exhaust you exhaust that first tier that you go through. Um, but those, so those names appear whether they're right for the role or, or not. And there were some extraordinary names coming for Pope Benedict. And the names that, um, I mean, I, I think I can say this, Christopher Walken's name appeared at one point. And I said, well, I don't want to be in it, but I'd certainly pay to go and see it. Um, so there you go. But I was uh, absolutely thrilled when um, uh, one of my, heroes, uh, Anthony Hopkins said, yes, he would play Pope Benedict. So every, all the, you know, all the fates were aligned. And, um, and then I turned out to have uh, one of the best producers in the world, even though she won't pick herself up. Uh, <laughs> Tracy, uh, did run that set and ran the film. In she said she, she referred to her being a mother hen, but it, it, but it, it did become a family and a very loving family and a very trusting family. And I think that comes through in the film. Mm -hmm. That's kind. Yeah, it's exactly. also fair to say, just to add to that, that um, it's really rare when you make a film that you get your, literally, the, your ideal cast and your dream cast without being messed about. So from the get-go, Fernando always wanted Jonathan. And he wanted to, to Anthony um, Hopkins. 
and it was unclear whether or not we were going to be able to get either because you know just one thing and another sometimes it just doesn't work like that so it was incredible it was incredible you know that um jonathan and tony agreed to do it and you know we were saying you know like whatever the um whatever happens when you're making a film whatever chemistry whatever magic happens whatever you do that is going to make your film spectacular, however many countries you go and shoot in, however many fancy sets you have and costumes, the essence of the story, everything, you know, I was always taught by Freers, Stephen Freers. It's always like script, script, script. And then it's about the, and then it's about the acting. Everything else is just whatever. That's not to denigrate the brilliance of everybody else's input. And in the two perps, we had incredible input. But what is amazing about the movie, it all comes back to the language and it comes back to Jonathan and Tony. Mm -hmm. That's like, for those of you who have seen the film, I mean, the, the two of the best performances in a film that you're like literally ever going to see. Yeah, you're an amazing pair. <laughs> um, to think about some of the sets that you shot at, were you able to film on location in Rome and were there any sort of favourite settings or particularly challenging ones um, in the film? To both of you, I don't know. Well, first, of, first of all, I think, you know, we could talk about Argentina because we started shooting in Argentina and thanks to Netflix, we were able to, you know, shoot in Argentina. And I say thanks because it's an expensive country. It's, it's literally the end of the world. And, um, they completely supported our desire to shoot in the actual places. So when we were in Argentina, we were able to shoot in a lot of the actual locations. So we shot in Colegio Maximo, uh, the seminary where, front, where Bergoglio was, um, and we shot there. We shot in Flores, in the cathedral in Flores. Um, we were in Cordoba. There were, there were lots of places. We shot in Vicha Trentuna, which is the... Um, um, I don't know what you call it. The Visha is the equivalent of like favela or whatever. Um, and so we started the film being able to really like work in those real locations, which I think lends a huge sort of like, I don't know, it grounds the film somehow. When you shoot in real places, I don't know, it just makes all the difference. But what was clear was that when we were going to shoot in Rome, we were not going to be able to have that... Um, you know, you can't, you, we weren't not, we were not going to be able to shoot in the Vatican location. So that includes obviously Sistine Chapel, uh, St. Peter's Square. Um, we were not going to be able to shoot in churches in Italy. We weren't going to be able to shoot in um, Castle Gandolfo, which is also Vatican property. Um, so we created a jigsaw, which is not unusual when we're making films, telling stories in television. Um, so that was much more challenging in a way to give it, to make you feel like the moment you feel like you're straying from the real place, then anything that is going to suspend audiences disbelief, unless that, unless that is your intention, you've got to keep everybody really feeling that they're in that location. And of course, you know, our centerpiece or two centerpieces really, the garden at Castle Gandolfo, we were able to shoot just outside and on the approach to it, and an aerial sh a drone shot. But the biggest like coup for us um, was building the Sistine Chapel at Chinachita, which I think um, is sort of underplayed in the, you know, when people talk about afterwards in like awards and things, because so many people thought we actually shot in the Sistine Chapel. Um, even though you can't take a photograph in the Sistine Chapel. Um, so it's one of those things where <clears throat> sometimes the design of a film becomes almost invisible, but it's actually the most visible part of sometimes a film. Um, but actually, you know, the, the construction of that was complicated in terms of rights and complicated in terms of the um, <clears throat> craftsmanship. Um, and there's a whole kind of Zoom webinar for you guys probably on that alone um the designer obviously Mark Tilgers I think did an amazing job but me Jonathan could speak to what it was like to film in to physically film in those places and what it what it gave to the performances well it was, it was 
a great opportunity to um, to find out more about uh, Bergoglio. Um, you know, filming in Buenos Aires first, and filming, especially for me, filming the uh, the giving of the or saying of the mass in Villa Ventuna, which is a kind of shanty town, um, which is. Uh, I mean, the people who live there are very poor, but they're very uh, proud of where they live, proud of their individual homes. And I think it was between four or 500 of them came out uh, to be part of that uh, mass. And um, seeing them and, you know, talking to them, um, uh, saying mass to them, and then going to the sort of the, the refined and uh, life in Rome, you understood why he felt what he felt about Rome and the, the, the trappings and the finery of the Catholic Church, um, because he really did come from working with uh, poor people. And, um, and that's, that's part of his character. But it was, and it also, it was incredibly moving to uh, be with these people, because they're kind of, um, the people, the sort of middle classes of Buenos Aires would prefer they weren't right on the edge of the city. They're in some of the the, the best kind of, um, um, what do you call it, uh, real estate in Buenos Aires, and they want them out. Um, so seeing the, the two sides of his story, also uh, filming in Buenos Aires and being that I got a chance to talk to people who knew him, uh, one particular priest who was advising us about the protocols of the church, um, had worked under Bergoglio when he was uh, there as the Cardinal Archbishop. And I was talking to him and asking him about this now world famous, very popular figure. And he said, I, we, I didn't like him. We didn't like him. Um, and when we saw him on the balcony, when he became Pope, we didn't recognize him because he was smiling. And we knew him as the man who never smiled. And he was a very kind of uh, authoritarian, stern figure. At, at a certain point in his life in Buenos Aires. Um, so that was very interesting to discover. If we hadn't gone to Buenos Aires, I wouldn't have uh, known that. And I carried that with me to Rome, as he did. Um, and then filming in, uh, I, th I think, yeah, we saw the insides of lots of different palaces and wonderful gardens, but the, um, the most extraordinary achievement for the, the designer of the film uh, Mark was uh, to recreate the Sistine Chapel in such glorious detail, uh, uh, minus the ceiling. Um, but he did, he, he managed to make it, I think it's about five, or, I don't know how many centimeters bigger than the actual Sistine Chapel. So he could say he built the biggest Sistine Chapel in the world. Um, but that was, uh, it was just extraordinary. And also I think we, um, being in that space uh, was a question of just being. You didn't have to do a lot of acting, and I don't think Fernando had to do a lot of directing. It was uh, it was a kind of given what would take place in that space. It's amazing. It's also interesting because sometimes you can build sets and <clears throat> you kind of just know you're in a set. Whereas on this occasion, somehow it sort of embodied. Um, it had a very kind of sacred feel to it and we had this um we had a, one of our advisors who um had written a couple of books for the vatican about the art collection had written a book about assisting chapel this wonderful man called enrico bruschini and we invited him to come and see it when the set was finished and he walked inside and literally burst into tears and um yeah we also managed to do yoga there and yeah when we went filming. So yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful set. Yeah, it's incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, at the end of the film, there's a cameo that gives us an insight into your Choose Love campaign. And we were just wondering if we could, you could tell us a bit more about your charity Help Refugees. Oh, it was sweet. Um, so in about, well, first of all, in the context of the film, we always had the number of ways of, that we wanted to close the film and um, speaking of Fernando Morellas, who's an incredibly collaborative director and has a sort of open table in terms of the team giving ideas. And, you know, so it's like, it's like, you know, it's a very, very kind of like, um, it's a living process working with him. Um, and 
we were thinking about how to end the film and we thought, oh, we talked about Francis's speech at Lampedusa in 2016, uh, 20, 2015, did she speech? Yeah, 2015. And um, we wondered how we could incorporate that, which speaks to the work that I've been doing since um, 2015, 2016, and since really the, the, the millions of Syrians fled their country across Europe. And uh, around that time, with a director called Stephen Daldry, um, we started a theatre in Calais called Good Chance Theatre. Good Chance is like, are you going to cross the, the are you going to cross the channel tonight? Are you going to have a good chance? So that was the sort of like, um, that's where Good Chance comes from. Um, so around that time, we started the theatre, and a group of young women started a charity called Help Refugees, which I'm a part of. Um, which now works in 16 countries as take it like directly responsible for improving the lives of about probably about two and a half million people in that time and you know as an advocacy and campaigning body and humanitarian and so we we've worked out we could fold in all of these things into the end of the film and during the filming during the prep and filming i worked with a group in Rome called Baobab Experience, which is a migrant um, su support group, NGO. And at that time, the migrants were living just behind Tibetina Station in Rome. And it was great, as Jonathan was saying about the kind of like feeling amongst the team when we were making the film. Um, so we organized a space in the studio and set deck and we, people who wanted to help, so we come together and we cook once a week by the veg in and things. And we cook for about four, 400 people um, at the studio and take the food down because there's no facilities there. So we thought, so Fernando, he's just genius. He was like, what we'll do is we'll take Jonathan to this mig the migrants camp at Tibetina and we'll feed them like we always do every week. Um, and of course, what's interesting is even though, like, you know, even in our, like our own country, like, all you guys living in London, you probably don't know where the food banks are necessarily or where the migrant safe houses are. So like in Rome, they didn't know about this camp particularly, that it's huge camp, was well, huge camp, Salvini obviously destroyed it. Um, so Fernando's like, great, we'll take Jonathan to Tibetina and we'll film there. And we'll just take a small crew and we'll, you know, just see how it goes. Sometimes these places can be quite dangerous, so you never know quite what's going to happen. So we explained to Andrea Costa, who ran it, um, what we wanted to do, had their full support. And we said, please make sure that all the um, residents know that we're just filming and they've given permission because sometimes people are concerned about their identity. But the, this is for a film, it's Jonathan Price and so forth. So we went down there and um, Jonathan, what was it like when we went and you were- Well, just... it was my, the first time I dressed up, we hadn't started filming proper and uh, in, uh, in Rome anyway. And I'd, uh, I think it's the first time I dressed as the Pope. And um, it, it was, I, I, I was worried because I, I felt a bit of an imposter um, and how they would accept me, but it was uh, there was a, a mix of people who really thought I was the Pope, um, and uh, and also people in UT. It was it was, it was quite a, a moving time. And then what was most interesting for me was some when we were uh, filming uh, Sistine Chapel scenes. Um, Tracy had invited uh, a group of the residents to come and be. Uh, be themselves, be the immigrants that Francis was showing around the Vatican. And uh, I went into the Sistine Chapel with a group of these guys. And um, by now they, they knew the whole setup. And um, Fernando said, J just point out a, a few things to them in the Sistine Chapel. We can't really hear what he's saying. So I pointed up to uh, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and told them the story. And uh, and they all listened very intently. And then we went for take two on it. And we came in and I 
I thought I might as well say the same thing. And not, you know, they can't uh, they can't hear me properly on the soundtrack. So I said, uh, so this is the story of Adam and Eve. I said, do you know the story of Adam and Eve? And they all went, yeah, you just told us. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they knew what they were doing. They were they weren't stupid. They were great guys. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so now we have a few questions just for Tracy. Um, how did you become involved in the 2012 Summer Olympics opening ceremony? And do you have like a favorite sketch from it? Um, well, Danny Boyle, who's the um, creative director, artistic director of the opening ceremony. We'd worked together before on um, a film called Millions back in the day that Frank Cottrell Boyce wrote. And so we knew each other and when he, he was given the task of um, directing the ceremony, um, he invited my, so my partner Mark is a designer. He, des he was the designer on Two Popes. And he also works with Danny and he designed the opening ceremony as well. So um, at that point, it was vague about what quite what they would need because it was run by an organizing committee. And so I was just helping them with ideas and so forth. Anyway, things changed very quickly and Danny asked me if I would produce the opening ceremony um, for him. So it, it came through, I mean, obviously vetted by hundreds of people. Um, but anyway, the invitation to join came from Danny, Danny Boyle, um, with whom I'm working with on a, a few other things at the moment. Um, it was interesting, you know, because I think working in a different medium was a huge medium. I'd never, I'd never produced a live event before, so that in itself was quite um, challenging, because obviously the audience. I mean, we had like ten thousand performers on the night and the audience was like 1.2 billion people or something. So there's sort of like quite, there's, there's quite a lot of pressure, obviously focused mainly on Danny, but obviously on the team. So it's quite, it was quite an undertake, it was quite an undertaking. And it made me long to do work um, in other media as well and work with other kinds of collaborators, which is something I've done really since, since 2012. Um, but in terms of, I suppose there's lots and lots of like great stories that came out of it. Um, some of them I can't tell, but probably the best one, I think, was in, so everything was secret, right? A hashtag save the surprise, um, particularly around Queen and James Bond, which in itself was just a, quite a big thing to pull off. Um, but we knew that if the story got out at any point, the, the Queen, the um, palace would can the whole thing. Um, because the whole point was that it was going to be a surprise. It was going to be a surprise for a lot of her family. Um, it was going to be a surprise because obviously she was wearing the same outfit as we had filmed her in. So there were lots of reasons why if it got out. And also for um, Daniel as well. So there was a lot riding keeping the surprise, but obviously it was a big thing to rehearse because we had two people parachuting into the stadium um, on the night with the timing that was like very complicated in a very dangerous area with the stadium and cranes and a grid. And I mean, like literally anything could have gone wrong. So we had a very elaborate series of doing our rehearsals for the jump, for the jumpers as we call them, Mark and Gary. Mark sadly died after that. Thankfully not. In fact, he died after that in a, skydiving accident but Mark and Gary were the jumpers and um, they were like we did our bit we only did the rehearsal on site twice at like three o'clock in the morning where we closed it like you know um, with air traffic control we had to close everything and what have you anyway they were like this is amazing what can we do and we've been rehearsing in the stadium for like a few weeks 20 hours a day lockdown you couldn't get anything in couldn't have alcohol in um and everyone wanted a drink because you're working 20 hours a day and like you're going crazy um so i said i know what you can do on thursday night the dress rehearsal you can bring me a bottle of 
bottle of Chablis, white wine. And so they did the rehearsal and on the intercom was this like, urgent, urgent, Gary needs Tracy. And he did the parachute jump with a chilled bottle of Chablis. <laughs> that was probably the, I was the only one to smuggle wine in because it was run by the army. You couldn't get anything in. Um, so yeah, that was probably my favourite story. There's so many stories you can imagine. I mean, it's mad, 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 mad. Funnily enough though, the person talking to Fernando, so he was around at hours for dinner. He lives in Brazil. He was around at hours for dinner and we were like, God, the Alex Olympics is going to be in Sao Paulo. We were all involved in the prep for London. We were like, God, you should do that. And he's like, no, 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 I'm never going to do it. Anyway, lo and behold, the next Olympics, Fernando was the artistic director for the opening ceremony in Rio. So it runs in the family. <laughs> it does indeed. Um, how involved are you in the casting process of your films? You've had some incredible cast, like Helen Mirren as the Queen, um, but such as like Steve Coogan in Philomena or Hugh Grant in Florence Foster Jenkins. How did you manage to cast them? Because that doesn't seem to be their normal sort of character type that they go for. Well, Coogan wrote Philomena. Um, Steve, Steve and Jeff Pope wrote Philomena. And the part of Martin Sixsmith was always going to be Steve. So that was really straightforward. And in that, there was only one person who we ever wanted to play Phil, and that was Judy. So in that case, you know, if Judy hadn't agreed to do it, then we wouldn't have made probably, well, somebody might have made the film, we wouldn't have made the film. Mm -hmm. Hugh, I think, is like an incredible, um, he's an incredible actor. And then he hadn't really acted a lot for quite a while. And he came to do, um, again, it's just one of those things sometimes. It's just like, it feels like only one person who's, who's right for a part. Like I was saying, the two popes for Jonathan and Tony, we always felt like that about Hugh. And then after that, Stephen did a TV series called A Very English Scandal with Hugh. which was just fantastic. Mm. He's just, you know, and I think Hugh's really enjoying acting again. Um, yeah, sometimes it's, you just don't know. Sometimes it's like, but involvement, yeah, sometimes a project might be quite well advanced and you end up getting involved with it and there is, a, you know, cast available, the cast are already attached to it. But generally speaking, you know, it's very much part of the job to assemble that team and mm. the cast. Um, Jonathan, we were wondering if we could just ask you some questions about um, Shakespeare. So we were just wondering, how do you make Shakespeare feel relatable to a modern um, audience? Oh my God, uh, I think you, you don't set out to do that. I think the, the um, it, it can, obviously it can work, but it, it's if your intention is to make it relatable and say, look at me, look at me, look at this moment, it's, it's not as powerful as when you just do the play and you discover that uh, the, the situations are timeless and um, uh, none more so than when I did uh, Merchant of Venice. I, I'd never wanted to do the Merchant of Venice. I thought it was a not very good play and I, I didn't like the character until I... Uh, sat uh, with the um, director Jonathan Mumby and um, we talked about how relevant it is to to today um, it, it, as itself and not having to update it in any way and not put it in modern dress or use modern anything in, in the modern idiom and I think that that way you um, you allow the audience to do a lot of work because sometimes if you dress it up as modern day, they go, oh yeah, I see, okay, that's fine. And that they're not thinking, they're not taking on board, but if it's still in its uh, original state, shall we say, um, they go through some kind of process in making it their own and they can take from it what they want to take from it rather than it being imposed and yeah. saying, you know, that Henry V is a man who carries a machine gun and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think, you know, if you choose the plays rightly, they are enormously relevant. Um, uh, uh, some uh, you, I w well, I wouldn't bother with because they had no modern relevance. But uh, yeah, I think you allow them to speak for themselves. 
Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think it's, that's a really good message to give. I was wondering just before, I think we're going to have to move on quite quickly to opening up the Q&A, um, but do you have any advice for students who'd like to follow in your footsteps, Jonathan? <laughs> no, absolutely none. Um, I, it's, um, oh my God, and now more than ever, it's, it's one of the most difficult times to be an actor and, and a young actor. Um, I hate to say in my day, but in my day, it was a damn sight easier. Um, there were theatres working up and down the land and uh, there was lots of work about. Um, now there are more, you know, also it was, it was limited entry. I'm, I'm very much uh, a union man and once they, Thatcher's government started to uh, dismantle the unions, um, the sort of uh, importance of the actor's job diminished. Um, and I'm not to say that it isn't you know, anyone can do it, but it, 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 there was a kind of uh, a restriction to the, the numbers, should we say, and, and people generally had to be trained. And there was the irony that you um, had to have a union card to get a job and you couldn't get a job unless you had a union card, which um, you would, you know, they, you could find ways around it. But uh, um, my advice is you've, um, you really, really, got to want to do it and uh it's not um the glamorous life that uh people uh imagine it can be although it, although it can be a very glamorous life <laughs> <laughs> i was going to say shall i share the photos of you yeah <laughs> Where? The, glam <laughs> the glamorous bits yeah uh, so you have a, uh, a you've got to want to do it and um it's really hard now because all is in my head is uh, lockdown and that theatres aren't going to be operating for at least a year. And um, a, a lot of young actors, um, I don't know, we're in a, some kind of time warp at the moment. It's hard. It's very tricky because, you know, like having this conversation, it's a great privilege to chat to you all. Um, but in a way, you know, like to some extent, you know, our, our path and our, our process now for you guys is like going to constantly evolve and react to whatever the situations are. So, you know, endlessly, you know, in terms of what would the advice be, is keeping that imagination, reimagining, you know, what the stage is, reimagining the landscape for a stage, like Jonathan was saying about the theatres being closed. So it's, it's about reimagining what the, the landscape is for that performance. Hold on a sec. Um, uh, re reimagining that, the stage, you know, reimagining the stage um, for the future. You know, for us, for example, when I think about us making our movie and we were traveling all over the world constantly, like if we were trying to make that movie now, how would we make, how, you can't always say, well, we couldn't tell that story, right? We'd be like sitting in a room thinking, how do we tell that? How do we tell the story in this in our socially distanced or post-COVID non-travel? We weren't able to go to Argentina, we weren't able to go to the Rome. How are you going to be able to tell that story? So it's keeping that, you know, obviously we're going to move away from the COVID. People are just going to start traveling again and so forth. But I think, you know, advice to you all is constantly, you know, like keep thinking of ways of circumventing what was kind of like usual process for people before. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just ask you one more question and then we'll go on to the Q and A's. Um, we wondered if you had any TV or film recommendations to fill our lockdown. <laughs> I've got a big one. Um, subscribe to Mubi. Mm. Yeah. That's the best money. That's the best money you can spend. Yeah, Cambridge people, we get that through university. So we're very, Me very you. Yeah. I was, watching, I was watching The Stranger. You know the Sajid Ray film? Yes, yeah, sir. I've seen that on there. Yeah. Mm, it's amazing. Um, Ellie, uh, do you want to uh, ask? Uh, me? Um, yeah, movie. I've, I find two things in movie. If you do the, go the Amazon route, it's a limited uh, uh, menu. You join movie itself, you get everything, you get the movie library. Um, yeah. So you don't have to have Amazon Prime unless you've already got it. 
you want your parcel the next day. Um, but on, uh, I don't even know if it's on movie. I know it's a Curzon um, Home Cinema is showing The Truth, which is the first, I think, English, English language film of the Japanese director, whose name's gone completely out of my head, who made uh, Shoplifters. Um, yeah. It is an extraordinary character study with uh, Catherine Deneuve, who I've not really thought much about as an actress over the years, but she just gives the most extraordinary performance as this um, completely sort of uh, pompous, uh, self-satisfied actress. It's just a wonderful film. It's very touching. And um, yeah, you can still see Capernaum again, which is one of my favorite films ever. Um, that's still on, uh, I don't know where it's on, one of them. But there's a lot out there. and. Um, the weird thing that I found is that I've got so much time and so much choice. I'm watching less films than I probably would do normally. <laughs> um, and I'm watching, the, I'm watching the beginning of a lot of films. I'm going, nah, I don't think so. I'm moving on. But um, I'm watching young television. Got hooked on American Idol. That was, uh, why the hell I was watching that? I don't know. But there you go. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. American <laughs> Idol. Mm. Uh, I, won't, I won't give it away because they announced the winner this week. Okay. So, yeah. okay. Thank you very much for those. We're going to move on quickly um, to some of the Q&As from the floor. We've got a few similar questions um, for you, Jonathan, about um, how you prepared to play the Pope. Did you ever get to be in contact um, with the Pope? Were you able to you know, speak with him? Um, how did you go about it? Um, no, I didn't uh, speak with him. There was a, an idea when we were in Rome that I would get to talk to him. In some ways, I, I really didn't want it to happen. I, um, I, I, now, having done it, I'd like to meet him. And uh, we think he's seen it. We, we have, we have, Tracy, have we had any definitive answers? Has he seen it? Unofficially. Unofficially, right, okay. I think he's seen it. Yeah. yeah. Because we had a screening in Rome and uh, priests from the Vatican came and one particular cardinal uh, requested a DVD uh, to take uh, to Pope Francis to show him uh, because he thought he would uh, enjoy it. But I, I like I, I've played quite a few real life characters over over the years, and um, I do a little research. But the most research I do is uh, is I read the script, and um, if if the writer has done their work it's all there in the script whether it's a fictitious character or a real life character and um with pope francis it was all in the script i knew what you know we, we had the advantage of him being a, a living pope so i knew what he said i knew what he thought um what was interesting was to look at youtube videos to see how he said things and how he walked and to get his character so i watched a lot even um I can just look at photographs of people and uh, absorb things from them. Like when I played Lytton Strachey, I was um, constantly looking at his image. Um, and a, a wonderful irony about uh, Pope Francis and uh, one of the things that, that I think Amazon is knocking at the front door now. Um, and uh, that um, Fernando, the very last shot of the film, uh, when I'm walking out of the Sistine Chapel, and uh, Fernando said, oh, Jonathan, it's, it's extraordinary. He said, you have absolutely absorbed everything about Pope Francis. You are him. You, you walk exactly like him. And at the time, I didn't have the heart to tell him that Pope Francis walks exactly like me. Um, I've got a dodgy knee. I think he's got a dodgy hip. And we've both got this kind of slight limp. Um, so that, all that helped. But... Um, also, yeah, Jonathan, so you should mention the languages. Oh, the languages, yeah. Well, that was um, uh, because he had, I had to speak uh, Spanish, a bit of Latin, and Italian, and, uh, and English. Um, so I spent time and I learned. Uh, I don't speak Italian or Spanish, so I had to learn them uh, phonetically. I mean, I'm, I'm, I can order meals in both those countries, but I... Um, and now, as long as the, the Pope says it, I can say it. <laughs> you know, if he's been into a restaurant before me, it'll be fine. So uh, that was also a very, uh, for me, it was, you know, it's like uh, you, you learn a lot of new skills as an actor, especially uh, film acting. 
And um, this was another skill which I enjoyed doing. And did it very well. Um, Thank you. Tracy, we have a question for you. Um, what was it like collaborating with Netflix um, and um, how did that collaboration come about? Well, Netflix wanted to, so we talked to Netflix about the project and rather than all of that, well, we'll get back to you and it depends, obviously everything depends on how much it's going to cost and who's in it, everything. But rather than just like the endless kind of like conversation we have with some financiers, they were just like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. They were in, literally, they love the story. They're in from the start and were hugely supportive of us and really gave us a lot of creative freedom to make the film. Um, so, for example, we went to Argentina and, you know, we cast the movie there. In, we were going to do it in Spanish, obviously. And, you know, they were always, like, really supportive, really supportive of what it is shooting there, shooting in Italy, building a Sistine Chapel to the right size. And that's not about like just throwing money away. It's also seeing what is really the essence of the film. And yeah, the creative support we had from them um, was really fantastic. And in fact, Fernando and I are developing um, our next film with them at the moment. Yeah, they were a great bunch. And they did a fantastic, fantastic and supportive job, you know, when we finished the movie and the campaign and they were brilliant, yeah. Highly recommend them to you guys. Yeah, if you want a job. Um, that, you're not always aware of the, uh, the, the, the money people on a, on a big film, but uh, you really were aware of the support they were giving this film. And um, the, the two guys who run it are uh, they're just extraordinary and they're intelligent people and they love film and they know what they're doing. Um, and then they don't just throw money at the wall and see if it sticks. Yeah. You know, it's, um, they are part of the creative process. And their producer, Sarah, uh, was, was amazing um, in her support for the film and her input. Um, Still have to pay question. Question, which I think is a bit of a cheat. I think they could have given me a lifetime subscription to the Netflix. There you go. At least Sarah's working with Ava DuVernay now, so. Wow. All right. Very good. There you go. Okay. Um, we've got a sort of joint question here. Um, if there's any character for you, Jonathan, that you'd like to play um, and any book, Tracy, that you would like to develop. Oh. Well, you people, a dream, dream role role now, project. Yeah. Well, people say, well, now you've played, sorry, now you've played the Pope, do you? It's the next one, God, and I, I'm afraid <laughs> I've already played God. So uh, I don't know where to go. I'm, I don't know. I mean, um, anything written by Ali Smith, anything written by Jackie Kay. Ooh. Um, I have a question that's from an anonymous attendee and they said, how do you reconcile the various creative perspectives that a team has to create a, create, uh, a cohesive creative vision? Depends who the, I tell you what, it really depends who, who the team, you know, the constituents of the team, it depends who the director is. And it also mm. depends who the financier is because the director is really the glue for the kind of creative cohesion. And of course we know that some, some directors are not interested in anybody else's opinion or going to run the set in a particular way. Personally, I'm blessed because I've got really a core of directors that I work with a lot. And um, each one is really different from the other one. Um, but it's really important for the, there has to be an authorial voice, you know. In TV, you're going to have your showrunner, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's just important to kind of balance all of that. And, like, you know, we always really like, you know, on our movies, we like the, the fact that people feel not just the HODs, but other people, obviously the cast, but, you know, have got creative input as well. So you try and create this sort of harmony between those departments. Sometimes that's about how you cast the heads of department as well as casting the film as well. 
Um, we've got a question here about, um, did you shoot chronologically? Did you shoot the two popes? Was it challenging also having to shoot in sort of two opposite ends of the world and think about, you know, we have to be done here by this date and then, you know, moving forward? Well, I'll say from a practical point of view, from a production point of view, no, we couldn't shoot it chronologically. I mean, we tried to do it in blocks and then we had to shoot the way our schedule worked. We had to shoot in Argentina first. Um, and then we had a break um, between shooting the two territories for various reasons. Um, and I think in Italy, I mean, we tried to, I mean, we finished in the Sistine Chapel, which was the sort of close, pretty much the closing of the film. Yeah. Um, but you know, the very few productions are able to shoot really chronologically. Um, I think Ken Loach still does. Um, and I think Terry Malick still does, but it's hard, you know, it's hard to do that for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. I don't know how well, you... It felt, it felt more than any other film for me that uh, my uh, character, it, it felt chronological to me because I started in Buenos Aires. So we, uh, I was aware of his life prior to going to Rome. And then um, it felt chronological in the, the series, I don't know if it was, but the series of meetings between uh, Francis and Benedict um, you know, the first time I met uh, Tony as Benedict on set is the first time that uh, Bergoglio meets uh, uh, Benedict. And so that, that played into the nature of the scene of some, you know, two people um, being aware of each other's reputations and sniffing around each other like two dogs. And then th those scenes progressed uh, as they became more friendly and uh, uh, Francis relaxed and uh, Benedict played the piano and those it all seemed fairly chronological to me. Yeah, we tried to do um, it as much as possible. Yeah yeah and then of course finishing in the, the Sistine Chapel yeah I mean I've done films where you the first thing you do is you die and then you work backwards. You know, so. <laughs> um, Jonathan there's a, a question about how you've acted in both theatre and film what do you find to be the main difference between the two mediums and do you have to act uh, well it's famously said in uh theater you just uh, shout you speak louder in film um but the, the the process that all the thought processes and the rehearsal processes are the, are exactly the same you're, tr you're trying to um tell a story using your character and other people's characters. Um, and I, I enjoy them for different reasons. Um, I mean, it's, I've been doing it for a long time, so I've made a lot of films and the, the, I, um, you know, I didn't always have choice. I mean, I've, I've got the choice now whether I play an old man with dementia or an old man without dementia. That seems to be my, my film choices at the moment. Um, but over the years I've, uh, I've done films for all, you know, to me it's a job and I need to make a living. And I've done um, films that uh, weren't necessarily that satisfactory, but I found something in the character that I've learned from, or I've done a character that hasn't been like the character before. Um, but the, and you're also in, in film, uh, uh, Tracy, it's, it's, it's a, a very collaborative effort and you have to trust the director and, uh, that they're not going to, I mean, what was great about this, the two popes is almost everything we did and saw, both Tony and I, is in the film. And um, there's a couple of little edits, little scenes that were unnecessary. Um, but on the whole, I was looking at everything I'd done. And sometimes you go and see a film you're in for the first time. And uh, like Pirates of the Caribbean, um, the last one I did, which is uh, number three, and I'd not been to the two previous premieres. I, I uh, saw the first one in Muswell Hill Odeon, which is how you're supposed to see it. Um, and uh, I w there wasn't really a lot for me to do in Paris the Caribbean. There hadn't been a lot to do in one and two, but very little to do in three. And the director said, I'm really embarrassed to ask you, but we'd really like to do three. And we've written this special scene for you, for you and Bill Nye to do together. And I thought, that's great. All right. That's the reason for doing it. And so I did this when we shot this scene in the Caribbean. And I went to the premiere in, uh, in Disneyland. 
in uh, California, a big open air screen and thousands of people sitting there. And I'm watching it with my uh, middle child who was then at, uh, Gabriel was at film school in New York and I'd invited him to come to LA. And I was watching this film going on and on and I thought, well, I turned to Gabe, who I thought was very film savvy and I said, Gabe, what's, what's going on? And he said, Dad, I haven't a fucking clue. And this was Johnny Depp running up and down the sand for an hour. But I thought, well, I've got this scene coming up. And sure enough, that we were building to the scene and pff, nothing wasn't there at all. And I turned to the director was behind me, Gore Verbinski, who resolutely did not look at me and did not talk to me for the rest of the night. Um, so you're const you know, constantly giving yourself over. Now, when I'm in theatre, especially in the later years, I, I'm much more in charge of what I'm doing. I mean, I feel um, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously with other people on stage and it, it uh, interests me to create pictures uh, within the, the frame of a theatre, whether it's thrust or proscenium. And I like the pictures we make together as people. It tells you how you relate to people, the shapes you make. Um, and I'm, I can also be my own lighting designer. I can be in that light, I can go out of light, I can adjust my volume. I can react to, the great thing about theater is um, you react to the audience and you can shape an audience and control an audience. You don't let, you, you know, if you let them laugh too much, you know, oh my God, this, the point is going out of this scene. Um, so those things, I like for different reasons, but you really have to trust the in film, you have to trust everybody else. That's the difference, I think. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have to round up there, unfortunately, but thank okay. you both so much for your uh, wonderful answers and for giving us your time. And thank you to everyone who joined the school and asked such amazing questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks. We look forward to seeing what you do. Thank you.